you are on camera. Today is March 21st, 2017. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Peggy Hilliard, another volunteer, and Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. <clears throat> We're here today uh, to record the oral history of Mr. Richard Todd and his military service in the U.S. Army during Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom in the Middle East. Mr. Todd's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored, we're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Todd, and thank you for participating in the, in the uh, project. Would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live, please? My full name is Richard Allen Todd, and I live in Pike County, Georgia, okay. which is part of Griffin as well. Okay. Can we begin by having you tell us just a little bit about your early history? Well, I was born in Florida. My dad was in the Navy, and I was born in Jacksonville, and... Uh, and while he was in the Navy, we stayed down around there. He wound up working with the FAA in South Carolina, and we were lived in Florence, South Carolina. Until 1971, we moved to Griffin, and uh, he, he got transferred to the center in Hampton, and I've uh, been here ever since. Okay. What was, did, did you go to school? Where did you go to school? Went to high school here, Griffin High School, graduated in 1976. Okay. Did you enter military service then? At that time, ROTC was mandatory for uh, freshmen. Okay. So I did my mandatory year. And you, you served in the National Guard. How did, you, how did that connection take place? Uh, after high school, I was going to uh, Gordon Junior College down in Barnesville, and I was working as well. I was working construction. Uh, a few other things, and uh, one of the things I was doing was working part-time at the Georgia Experiment Station, and there was a man there named Bill Slaughter, and we got to know each other through working together. He's an older guy. He was older to me then, and, uh, and he would always uh, greet me every day, say, when are you going to come drive my tank? And, uh, and I, guess, I guess I was 18. And nothing sounded better than driving a tank. And uh, he said, uh, I'm telling you, if you want to do it, just let me know. And uh, so uh, I, he got me. He got me with that. Uh, free bullets and driving tanks sounded great to me. I loved to hunt. I loved to shoot. And shoot the big gun. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, so me and a buddy decided we were going to join on the buddy plan. And, uh, and I was living with him. He's passed away now, but I was living with him in a trailer in East Griffin. And we decided we were going to go in together, and uh, he failed the physical. So, you know, we discussed, you still want to do it, this and that and the other. And I said, well, I'm, I'm committed to it now, so I went ahead and went. And uh, so that's how I wound up in the well, in Tell us about the goal. training experience. Well, it was, uh, I remember leaving Atlanta in fe on February the 5th, I believe it was, and it was probably 60 degrees and sunny, and landing in Fort Knox just a couple hours later, and, I, and if I recall, that year was an historical blizzard. And for a guy who'd never really been anywhere, we landed, and I was like, man. Uh, so, and the snow didn't melt until probably the end of March. So it was... An experience. It was an experience. So how long did it take you before you got to be in a tank? Well, the first six weeks is what they call basic. And in the second phase, depending on what MOS you're going to go to, uh, is called AIT, Advanced Individual Training. So for about six weeks, you're just doing the basic, you know, soldier stuff. And then you get specially involved in your AIT. So about, about the uh, six week in, started getting exposed to tanks. So what was your specific responsibility in the tank, as a tanker? It was a, it was a, the MOS was a tanker, and it was an M60 tank. Okay. Uh, I did have an advantage in that when I joined the Guard, I had a couple drills at our local unit before I went to basic, and we had an M48. And uh, <coughs> so I got to get in there and play around with it and get a little familiar with that, but then this was a new model. Uh, so 
what what they do is they initially train you. They train you for every position, uh, the driver, the loader, and the gunner. And uh, and then there's one other person that's the tank commander, which obviously you as a young soldier, you're not going to get that until you've done all the others for quite a while. So, so you do you do driving, you do loading, and you do shooting. When you returned, how long how long were you on active duty? Fourteen for training. Weeks. Fourteen. Months. Fourteen weeks. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you came back to the Griffin area. I did. And you got a job. Yeah, I picked up what I was doing when I left off, just like uh, just like I thought I would, and uh, and treated this as another job. Um, and uh, I was doing those things I mentioned before in construction, uh, working with the experiment station. Uh, got married in uh, 1981, and uh, and had our first child in 1982. Soon enough that everybody was counting the months. And uh, so that put an additional financial burden on, on our young family. So I, I wound up getting more jobs and uh, just doing what it took to take care of the family, you know. Uh, and I considered the National Guard, you know, one of those jobs. Right. How long was your initial commitment to the National Guard? Six years. Six years, okay. Mm -hmm. So t tell us about what it was like. Uh, to be in that unit at that time, you're just relatively young. I mean, uh... that's a great question. My unit had a significant population of Vietnam veterans, okay. and uh, and the National Guard at that time was viewed in an unfavorable light. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's because of them. I'm saying it's because the group as a whole was viewed that way. Like any other population, you got good and bad in everything you do. But uh, that was a time when, uh, say, some of these guys uh, wanted to have longer hair. So it was the first time I learned that men would wear a wig on a weekend to uh, meet the requirement for drill. I had no idea you could do that. But I came back a fresh private. And most of these folks in the unit are generally older. And uh, as a private, I remember my first drill, I put on my dress uniform and I showed up like I thought I was supposed to do. And uh, they looked at me like, where in the world he come from? And, and what's he doing here? And uh, I mean, I only had like one stripe, you know, maybe a PFC by then, I don't know. But anyway, so they said, well, you're freshly trained, so you are now the primary trainer for the rest of the unit. <laughs> so... <laughs> Every class, when I wasn't on a detail, when I wasn't on KP or policing up something, and I was teaching classes because they said, well, you got the freshest training. And uh, I will say that uh, there were those in there who took, took the job pretty seriously, you know, uh, but there were also those that looked at it as a getaway. And a lot for the Vietnam veterans, it was a lot more uh, almost like a veterans group uh, opportunity for them to, you know, talk about things with each other. While you in those, this is the 80s? This is the 80s, mm -hmm. This is, be, we weren't really in anything shooting at the time. Were we? No, no, I mean, I, see, I graduated basic in May of 78. So, so this is from 78 into the early 80s. Uh, just the Cold War. Did, and, the, and, did, yeah. did the state, um, Use your use the resources of the National Guard for any uh, problems at the time. They did things like that. They did. We would, uh, you know, if there was any sort of uh, potential for a riot, a lot of times they would round us up and put us in a location to respond if it was necessary. Uh, there, you know, there was still some. Um, I can remember uh, working at a riot that the KKK had initiated. Uh, and then later on down the road, all the way through, you know, 1996, we worked the Olympics. But, okay. uh, yeah, as uh, far as disasters, floods, we were used in the floods in, in Georgia during that time, uh, which was really in the 90s as well. So, were you f how frequently were you mobilized to support these kinds of things? I mean, it wasn't Not just very. on, on, on uh, drill weekends. No, no. I mean, we would train for them. <clears throat> But actual events, 
Uh, not that many, really. I would I would say if we if we were mobilized for what you would call a civic disturbance mm. uh, or a natural disaster, uh, those occasions would have been maybe once every two three years. Okay. So it wasn't a great impact on on your civilian responsibilities. No. How many tanks did you have in the unit? Hmm. Let's see. We had. We had two tank platoons and we had two uh, personnel carrier platoons. So that was eight tanks. Okay. Plus one, the commander rode in the tank. So there was nine tanks. So did where did you train? Did you just run around the Griffin area? Or? Well, those tanks weren't actually here. We had oh, okay. one here to train on at home station. We, we normally went to Fort Stewart. Okay. In Savannah. Right. And, and run uh, around in the woods down there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fort Stewart and Fort Benning, Fort Stewart and Fort Benning. A lot of that. For summers or like on the weekend? For summers, for long weekends. Sometimes we do what you call a muta six where it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday drill. Okay. And that kind of thing. But most of the time when you were at, at home station, you were in training um, either military subjects or That's other right. Things. That's okay. right. Just sort of individual kind of things, you know, map reading, uh, <clears throat> NBC training. I mean, just the whole gamut. When... Did you first get an inclination that the unit was going to be mobilized or that National Guard in general would be affected by the conflicts in the Middle East? Well, the first time <clears throat> was uh, during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. We were what they call a round-up unit for the, third, or for the 24th Infantry Division, okay. which is now the 3rd. And what that meant was our brigade, the 48th Infantry Brigade, if the 24th was sent to war, we would round up their numbers. We would be an additional brigade to support their mission. So uh, when, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and we decided we were going to get him out of Kuwait, then the 24th ID was at the top of that list because they were a heavy mechanized force and he had what was assumed to be a heavy mechanized force that we would be fighting. So uh, those guys got sent August of 90 uh, to Kuwait and started training in Kuwait. We got mobilized in November. Uh, there was a lot of politics behind the scenes between the branches of service. Uh, the, the active component did not want to see the National Guard come in, uh, take their resources, so to speak, uh, and they didn't have confidence in our ability to do what we would need to do when we got there. Um, so it took that long to, before they said, no, we're going we're gonna to go through with this thing and we're going to mobilize you guys. And, and they sent us out to Fort Irwin, California in December, the day after Christmas in 1990. Uh, we were in the Mojave Desert uh, to train up and be sent over to join the 3rd ID, or the 24th ID, I'm sorry, in Kuwait. So you, were they training you on M1s? Uh, we were actually, by that time, uh, we were a Bradley unit. Okay. In 1986, uh, we, we wound up with uh, pure Bradley, which is in a, we had what you call cavalry fighting vehicles. And so you had three back seaters and you had a crew of three. And uh, <clears throat> so we were training in Bradley's in our unit. And they gave us what was at the NTC was serial number Bradley's that probably were the first handful to roll off the assembly line. And they didn't have parts. They were broken. So they gave them that to us and said, y'all go get it. And so... We were thrown into an active duty system coming from a reserve component system of resupply and ordering parts and things that we had to learn. And so it took quite a while just to get our vehicles up to standards where they could train on. And uh, so we wound up being out there, they called it the long rotation. It was 60 days. And, uh, and I can't remember the day that uh, uh, the invasion occurred but in 100 hours, it was over with. So uh, they, uh, they came back and said, well, we have two options. We can send you on over there just to complete the process, uh, or we just send you back home. And 
see what happens next time, and that's what they wound up doing. Uh, but, you know, they I think they tried to appease us uh, because there was a lot of disappointed folks. Uh, nobody knew the war was going to be over with that quick, and we were all convinced, yeah, we're going to go. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so they did their best to try to appease us, saying the tactics that we were perfecting out there were critical to their success over in country. Yeah. Well, and it, just to rewind a little bit here, when when the word started filtering down that you all were going to deploy, what was the reaction like? Uh, I'm sure it was varied in, in the units, but I mean, what was the general tone? I think it was, uh, you know, naturally uh, for young guys, all full of, you know what, you know, they were they were pretty fired up about it for the older guys. Even some of our guys who were still in that were, had Vietnam experience, they were like, mm, you guys need to be careful what you're wishing for here. And then, uh, but as a group, uh, the one unique thing about being a cavalryman is it's, you develop a loyalty to that unit and a loyalty to that type of uh, military association that you're not going to let your buddies down. So you're going to go. To the point of, you know, they were, we were finding out things. I had a friend who uh, had just got braces. He said, well, you can't wear braces and go over there. He said, well, take them off. You know. So, I mean, that's an example of yeah. <clears throat> guys who had jobs, guys who own their own businesses. You know, put that on hold and don't know if they're going to have that when they get back. So. What about the community? How did the community react to... Yeah, that's <clears throat> consistently with Griffin's history of support for veterans. Uh, and and probably, I guess, since that was the first time something had happened that hit close to home since Vietnam, uh, I think everybody sort of embraced the, let's, you know, show them all the love we can and send them out. And did the same thing when we came back from Fort Irwin. So when you came back from Fort Irwin, was that kind of a busted balloon? It was for me. Yeah. yeah, because you just felt like you got shorted there. And uh, I mean, not that I wanted to leave my family and yeah. my daughters and, and everything forever, but you know, you train, you train, you train, you train, and uh, then you don't get in the ball game and you know, go home. So we went back to doing what we did morale did stay high. Morale did stay high. Yeah, it, it did stay high. Because we, we learned a lot about ourselves out there, too. I mean, we had to do a lot of uh, adapting. Uh, and, and we were not given the greatest support. Um, but we were able to overcome all that. And, and, and just that environment, for 60 days in that environment, uh, the ones who experienced that knew that, well, you know, I can pretty much handle anything. I mean, they, we, we were fighting their Op 4, world-class Op 4 out there. Uh, once our equipment issues were fixed, we were consistently defeating that Op 4 uh, handily. So so morale was high regardless. So you came back and then just fell into the routine again? Fell back into the routine, back to uh, doing our Bradley gunnery, doing everything else that a National Guard unit does. We had, by, and when we came back, we wound up getting tanks back. We had Bradleys, heavy mortars, and uh, and all that. So, I started out as a tanker. Uh, I became full time in the National Guard in 1986 as a training NCO for the local unit. That was a mortarman's MOS, 11 Charlie. So I went to school and uh, I got qualified in that MOS, and I was a mortarman until Desert Storm when uh, the commander uh, asked me to be his gunner on his Bradley. Uh, well, I say asked me, you know, the commander doesn't have to ask a whole lot. And he's like, you're gonna be my gunner. So then I went to Bradley school and got qualified for that. So when we came back, I went back to being a mortarman after Desert Storm. So talk a little bit about Desert Storm and how you got into that. You know, uh, the Roundup concept, I think they found out there that it wasn't going to work. 
Uh, that's the only reason we got involved in that. Uh, I believe uh, we weren't the only National Guard unit that was mobilized for that, but we were one of the first, and there was very few of them. I, I just don't recall all of them. So uh, there was there was the indication that people were starting to take the Guard more seriously, especially after that long rotation and our performance at the NTC. And, and I think it benefited uh, the Guard as a whole, really, for, when it was all said and done. So how did the word come down about Desert Storm? Are you talking about Iraqi freedom? I'm sorry, Iraqi freedom. Yeah, yeah Iraqi freedom, um, we, uh, we knew on 9-11 we were going to go to a fight and uh i mean that was uh that was unprecedented so you knew if you're wearing a uniform you're doing something and we knew that we were uh resourced with the right equipment and personnel to get involved in that fight so uh, i mean when that happened we immediately locked down the armory uh, we we secured the uh, grounds at the armory 24 hours a day and uh, and waited on the call and uh, waited on the call and trained and trained and waited and waited. And then uh, we got probably late 2003, they said, yep, it's going to happen in this coming year. And uh, and I believe we got our order in September of 04 that we were mobilizing for Iraqi freedom. Same reaction? from the, 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 the guys, the unit? Uh, I would say by this time, uh, uh, there was a, a lot of chomping at the bit to get there. Okay. Well, I'm trying to remember what the news coverage was like at that time. Was there any uh, apprehension about? Uh... Yeah, uh, you know, because uh, they're talking about weapons of mass destruction. They're talking about chemical weapons and and so it's the, it's the unexpected, uh, but uh, we also knew, you know, w looking at history, uh, all that hype about those forces during Desert Storm proved to be false. Uh, so we weren't concerned. We had the technological and the training advantage. We weren't concerned about uh, in the big picture. Uh, same old concerns for the soldiers, uh, families, what's my family going to do? Because uh, you wound up getting an order within a couple months that said, uh, you're on active duty now for 365 days unless sooner or later released. Hmm. So you knew 365 days and sooner wasn't going to be very likely. So, <laughs> so you get that order. And <clears throat> so the Patriots the Patriots in the National Guard start start making arrangements with their families. And and I say Patriots because these folks are putting their lives on hold and uh, and going off and doing, you know, an honorable thing. So I would say it was a lot of chomping at the bit. We were we were pretty ticked off. We stayed real ticked off about nine eleven. When when did you actually move? We, we went back to the desert, <clears throat> went back to the Mojave uh, in February or March of 05. We went to Fort Stewart in December, November. November we went to Fort Stewart. And in January, and we did some training at Fort Benning as well. And then in January, uh, some of the units were going to different uh, bases in country. And then, uh, and then, Late February into March, we went out to the NTC where they had constructed mock villages. They had role players and they knew kind of what the fight was supposed to be like to train us in. You know, it's, it was basically called uh, uh, stabilization and security mission uh, operations other than war, where here's a line and these are the bad guys and these are the good guys and y'all go at it. Uh, there was a whole, there was a big learning curve going on about how to deal with the different 
tribes and everybody else that we were going to be dealing with, depending on where you were going. And uh, so that's what they had developed at the NTC, Fort Irwin. And uh, so every unit that was going went through there before they went. Yeah. NTC means National Training Center. Right? right. Okay. So how long were you there up in NTC? We were there for... Mm, I believe it was maybe five or six weeks. Okay. No more than that. Came back to Fort Stewart and started getting our stuff ready to ship. So you, you left from Savannah? To Iraq? Yeah. We did. Well, what about Afghanistan? Afghanistan, we left from Mississippi. Okay. I know. On, on the Gulf? Don't try to make sense yeah, of it. Okay. It's just it's not worth it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, so the, you, you went over on ships? No, no, we flew. Okay, so your gear Our gear, up? our big stuff had already been shipped. Because, okay. you know, it takes weeks, yeah. months to get that stuff on the ground. We had an advance party go over there. All that stuff was going into Kuwait before it was pushed up into Iraq. So we had... We had folks who went over there a month early to receive that stuff, get it organized, and get it pre you know prepared for us to get there. So, uh, we flew out of Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah uh, in May, early May of '05. Of '05. Mm -hmm. And then we flew to uh, you stop over in Germany. Uh, it's an adventure. So far, right? You know, and then you land in Kuwait, and then uh, and that's when I knew this is going to be completely something. What was I, your first reaction? I mean, what's the most memorable thing when you got there? Heat, heat, yeah, okay. yeah, heat and uh, dust, and they put us on this bus in the middle of the night pulled all the shades. We had an armed escort that was driving us to a base in Kuwait and they were playing that Arabic music. And I just remember sitting on that bus going, golly, this is... Where am I? <laughs> yeah, am I? This, this is a whole lot less fun than it was a little while ago. So anyway, yeah, it got daylight at 4.30 in the morning. And by eight o'clock in the morning, it's 120 degrees. It's crazy. So hydration was an issue. Yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't get enough water, and you couldn't touch anything. I mean, we had to get there. We had to shoot our weapons, but it was so hot that you couldn't get a cheek weld on your weapon because it sends your face. <laughs> it's, you know, it's it's to the point where you just got to laugh about it. It's this is ridiculous. It's so ridiculous. It's funny. You know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, you're there. Yeah. Did you were you did did you have any exposure to any of the allies over there, either Middle Eastern allies or European? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were all kind of different countries with NATO over there. Uh, didn't interact with them much. Just saw them. You know, they would be in their own part of a base that you might be on. Uh, some some Australians. I can remember talking to them when you go to a a PX or something, some area where the people would congregate. Because this was a big staging area for everybody to push up into Iraq. And, uh, but, you know, for the most part, uh, you were just trying to stay hydrated and get your stuff ready to go. You went to a lot of meetings, a lot of briefs about what to expect, and, uh, and kept in the dark a whole lot about where you're gonna wind up going. So did you, uh, did you meet with your equipment? There? We did. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when were you functioning as a unit? Within three days. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty quick. Yeah, we were ready. So once you were operational, what happened next? Well, we had the, uh, we had the mission. One platoon was given a mission of escorting low boy trucks with equipment on it up to Baghdad. And uh, they would be the ground convoy. And that was our, our second platoon. I was in first platoon. I was a platoon sergeant for first platoon. 
and uh, the rest of us were going to fly into Baghdad and link up with them. So, uh, so those guys, we were like, whew, sucks to be y'all, you know, uh, but y'all go get them. We'll see you when we get there. You just do what you're told, right? <clears throat> and, uh, and, and they made it with no incident. Uh, I mean, you got guys in Bradley's on top of a low boy in the turret and it's loaded up. So, you know, other than IEDs, uh, you were not probably going to get attacked by anybody who expected to be successful. Did they keep the unit in the area of Baghdad? Yeah, you know, we flew in, and that's a funny thing. We did, we, we flew in twice, actually, the first time. Uh, the first time, apparently, they didn't coordinate with a, a big operation that was going on, and we wound up in the middle of uh, fast movers that were engaging targets around Baghdad in this C-130, and to the point where the pilot got nervous, and he turned us around, flew us back to Kuwait. He said, we got to try that again. We weren't supposed to be there during that. Said, okay. But yeah, so we did. We finally, we finally landed in Baghdad, my first uh, what they called a combat landing, uh, and that was something really unexpected, and that's you know, meant to avoid rockets and, and such. Uh, beats any roller coaster you've ever been on. And we linked up with our guys. It probably took three or four days for everybody to get settled, and we were at Camp Stryker, and we still did not know exactly what our mission was going to be. We just knew it was going to be somewhere around Baghdad. So when, did, I guess, when, when did you officially find out what your mission was, and how did that go? Uh, <clears throat> well, my first mission, there was a New York National Guard unit that was a cavalry troop that was leaving. They were within a couple weeks of leaving. Our commander uh, met with their commander and said, hey, we want to do some right seat, left seat rides. And right seat, left seat rides are an outgoing unit will bring in an incoming unit, and they'll let you ride passenger, see their area of operations, their tactics. And then at the end of that, you switch places, and the guy says, yeah, I think you got it. They go about their way, and you pick up the mission. So, <clears throat> so we were there uh, probably just a few days, and uh, Commander uh, came and told me and the, uh, as the first platoon sergeant and the second platoon leader, he says, you guys are first up to go out with the, uh, with the New York Cav Troop and do a right seat, left seat. I said, okay. And, uh, and uh, I mean, we weren't on that mission an hour before we were in a firefight with troops that we don't normally work with. He was with another platoon. I was with the commander of that Cav Troop in his vehicle and uh, we wound up getting in a running firefight in uh, southwest Baghdad. And uh, so I remember I was uh, chewing tobacco, and I went through a whole package of tobacco, and I didn't spit it all that day. Uh, so I came back. I said, wow, it's going to be a long year right here. But we talked to the commander. You know, I ran into, my, I ran into my, my trooper buddy who was a platoon leader with 2nd Platoon, as we were going block to block, chasing these guys, and uh, he looked at me like, "Yeah, I said, yeah, yeah. How about this?" And uh, but anyway, we made it back from that. And we told Commander Lennis, those guys, a, a common tendency, and I'm not talking bad about these guys. A common tendency is, you get close to go home, you get a little bit kind of, maybe a little more lackadaisical about your tactics. And I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying that. We didn't want to find out that that was the case with our guys in tow. So I believe that was the last time we went on a right seat, left seat ride with that, with that group. Okay. So you, you, was your, what was your primary mission once the other guys were gone and you, were, you had the turf? Combat operations in the Triangle of Death is what we found out. We were at Stryker, and they call the Triangle of Death an area that's south south and a little bit west of Baghdad. And it's, uh, the reason they call it that is it's because it's evenly mixed with Sunni and Shia. Uh, 
who are constantly at odds and they settle their their scores you know in the most dramatic fashions uh, and the only thing they could agree on was trying to kill us okay. when they weren't trying to kill each other so uh, we were attached to the 3rd Infantry Division, like Deja Vu, which was the former 24th ID. And, uh, and they sent us to uh, what they call the Triangle of Death. And uh, we thought that was a nice name. Uh, who, who named it? The, the U.S. forces or the uh, the, the, the Iraqis actually named it okay. the Triangle of Death. And then, uh, you know, they said, you're going to go down there and you're going to replace another unit. And uh, they sent us to a FOB. In uh, Mamadia. Explain what a FOB is. A FOB is a forward operating base, and it's basically you have your big bases, which are big logistical hubs uh, where you can get resupplied. You can, uh, usually, there's a good you know medical facility close or built in there or whatever. And then your FOB is just an outline, small base, place for soldiers to uh, eat and sleep. And uh, so they sent us down there uh, to Mamadia, and we thought we were going to stay together as a CAV troop, but they sent one of our platoons over to Yusufia, which is part of that triangle. And uh, so we wound up with one platoon over there with another company. Us, uh, we were part of Task Force Rough Rider, mostly based uh, in Mamadia. And we were nearly a battalion size element, uh, but we were also spread out to a couple mm -hmm. of the FOBs. But that Mama Dia was the hub of those other two fobs. Uh, those other two fobs being even more primitive than the one we were on. And we were what, sleeping in tents. What would you say was the, the average distance between fobs? Uh, 15 clicks, okay. uh, 12 miles maybe, 10, 12 miles. So you weren't that close? No. I mean, it was... Uh, it was a hairy distance between the FOBs, and we traveled frequently between all of them. So were the FOBs covered by artillery? Uh, we actually had an artillery battery in our FOB, okay. uh, which could reach to the limits, those other FOBs. Uh, but... There wasn't a whole lot in our area. There wasn't a whole lot of need. We were we were constantly keeping it registered, keeping it uh, where they could respond if they needed to. But rarely did, was there any uh, call for artillery in in our little AO there. So what what's a typical day like at the FOB? Well, a day at the FOB, depending on on your, you know, it's almost like shift work. Uh, we started out missions in the day, and we wound up finishing missions in the night. You basically uh, prepare for your mission, uh, get your rest, go on your mission, come back, get your rest, prepare for your mission. It's Groundhog Day, day after day after day after day. What, what was a typical mission? It would depend. We would get, uh, what we wound up doing was conducting a lot of uh, searches uh, a lot of uh, going out to find a certain person and bringing them back if we could. Uh, some humanitarian on occasion, if we know of a, a school uh, that's being harassed, uh, maybe go try to figure out what we can do to help there. Uh, but mostly it was uh, mostly it was looking for bad guys. That's what it sort of morphed into, looking for bad guys, looking for guys trying to blow us up with IEDs. Well, I mean, when you say looking for bad guys, was it like driving down the road and waiting for somebody to... A lot of it was... Uh, bait? Big? Bait. B-A-I-T. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and I was like, this is crazy. You know, you... but presence patrols is what they like to call them. Okay supposed to maybe uh, discourage. And uh, so, you know, except for that guy who can do it from a distance and run and hide when it's done. So, uh, But my platoon in particular, we spent probably the majority of our time, we figured out these cats go to bed at night. And we actually would get with some other 
units in the area uh, who had some intelligence and uh, we would share intelligence. Okay, he's right here, let's go get him. So that's, we did a lot of that. What, did you have interactions with the locals? Yes, all the time. What was the reaction f from them to your being there? To your face, uh, they loved it. Um, you know, we're so glad you're here. Thank you for coming. Give me some money. Give me something. Give me, give me, give me. Uh, which got sort of to the point of, um, you know, I'm giving you my time right now. Uh, because, you know, collateral damage would occur and, and our way of uh, saying we're sorry was to give you money. Um, so if you talk to them to their face, they, they would love having you there. And then you catch that same guy a couple of nights later, a couple of days later, trying to kill you. Um, the consistent thing is, is kids. Innocence, the kids, you know, that's, that was, you could trust the kids is that, and that's about it, to be kids. You couldn't trust anybody else to be telling you anything of any value. Uh, I mean, you're talking about men who had families, farmers. This is a farm area. This is an agricultural area, a lot of canals. I mean, it's basically in between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. So the water system is unbelievable. Uh, and the way they've channeled it to grow their stuff. And uh, <clears throat> they would just try to raise their family and mind their own business. And uh, insurgents, whatever you want to call them, would come in there and say, hey, we planted a bomb in front of your farm, and we're going to need you to blow up an American first chance you get. And if you don't, we're going to kill your family. And so, you know, put yourself in mm -hmm. that predicament for just a place. second yeah. uh, but uh, yeah so so there was no trust we did have an interpreter uh, and uh, he wanted to be armed but we wouldn't let him be armed I mean even if he was trustworthy he was such a uh, klutz he was going to shoot somebody before it was over with but he uh, he was a inadequate interpreter you know, I remember riding by and seeing some new graffiti on a wall of a compound that we'd been spending a lot of time at, and I thought that graffiti might mean a warning or something, and, uh, and I asked our, our, what we called our terp. I said, what does that say? He goes, I don't know, it's in Arabic. So we got us a new interpreter the next day. <laughs> what was your impression of uh the Middle Eastern forces, the allies, the guys in green suits. The Three Stooges. I gotta be honest, part of our mission was to train those guys. Uh, and uh, and it was, uh, it was comical at times. Uh, but one thing I would admire is when we had a mission and we were going out in our armored Humvees to, to do a particular mission. They would be on the back of an open flatbed truck. Uh, and we were way better protected than they were. Uh, I admired that about them, but I didn't know if it was because uh, they were brave or just uh, not real bright. We spent a lot of time training those guys and a lot of time uh, learning that we weren't doing a whole lot of good with them. There were exceptions. There were exceptions, but there were so many tribal allegiances in that region that the last person you want to show any sort of loyalty to is an American, because that will get you and your family dead in a hurry. On the roads, uh, did you have many uh, IED incidents or mining incidents? We did. Any, any bad ones, any? Mm-hmm. We got hit, I told you about going out with New York on that right seat, left seat right. ride. When we finally got to Mamadia, uh, our very first mission out, we had a second lieutenant, my platoon leader, and you know, they're always 
pretty solid, right? Uh, he decided we were going to go out at 1500 that day. It was about 120 degrees. And he said because his, uh, his research had indicated that the insurgents uh, don't, don't uh, attack us when it's that hot. And uh, we got blown up that day. Uh, escaped serious injury, had some vehicle damage. Uh, and then uh, the very next day, uh, we were doing a mission over to our Yusufia, where our other platoon was, and uh, we got blown up on that mission coming back. So it was a daily occurrence uh, with our unit, I would say, for weeks. Maybe not my platoon every time, but between the other platoons and in our area in that triangle. It was constant. It was, it was uh, routine. Even when you weren't on mission to hear the explosions, then you know who's out there, you know. How long did it take, would it normally take to recover uh, the vehicle, get the casualties out, you know? I'm, I'm sure you're, you're some distance from the FOB. I mean, how long, what was the situation like that? Like you had to stabilize the area and, and uh, wait for somebody to come pick up the pieces? You know, if, uh, if air wasn't grounded, uh, you could get your casualties evacuated pretty, pretty quickly into the green zone. Uh, but dust storms being pretty frequent, uh, a lot of times you didn't have air support. So you were going to have to do a ground evac. And we had to do several of those. And a ground evac, you know, and it depends. You've got to secure your equipment. Mm. Uh, one IED, uh, uh, you know, the IEDs would totally destroy the vehicle. Rarely would you drive away a vehicle after an IED. Uh, so you had to secure that vehicle, get your casualties out of there. Uh, if there was air, uh, it was a great feeling because you knew somebody got hit, your guy was going to get treatment real quick. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> if, it was, uh, if it was no air, I remember we were working with another platoon and we wound up uh, evacuating some of their casualties uh, in a dust storm. And uh, that process took a couple hours. And you're going right over the same routes that you may just wind up getting blown up again on. When you mentioned dust storms, I mean, in in the news coverage, every once in a while they do a piece about a dust storm. I mean, visibility was almost non-existent. That's right. It? Did you use a uh, uh, protective mask? No, uh, vis goggles. I can't. You know, I can't think of my thermals, mind. night Thermal, vision. Yeah. Uh, well, no, um, not thermals. Uh, you really, uh, in the daytime, it was just a dust storm. And the worst I'd seen a dust storm was probably where you could see maybe, uh, maybe 50 feet in front of you, maybe. And that's the worst I've seen it. Of course, a lot less than that will ground aircraft. Mm -hmm. Uh, I never saw it like you see in the movies where this wall of dust is coming. I, I kept looking forward to seeing that. I wanted to experience that, but it never happened that way. It just sort of was there. Uh, but I mean, usually the, the good thing about a dust storm is nobody's fighting in a dust storm. You're just, you know, you're just waiting on the dust to lift. Did you ever have any situations where, uh, I don't know what to call the enemy, the, Af the uh, ISIS folks, or whoever they were. Yeah, this is this is pre-ISIS. Uh, we had we had names for them, but uh, I guess you could just call them insurgents. Did, did did you ever have any experiences where they tried to take a fob? Uh, we we we'd have experiences. Yeah, I would say in a feeble attempt to take a fob, uh, those that were ready to go meet Allah. Uh, did make a make an effort, uh, but most of the time they would throw a mortar uh, tube in the back of a pickup truck, drive around, find a good place to hide, and start lobbing mortars into the fob. Sometimes rockets, if they got their hands on rockets. Different IEDs. They're all you know in, improvised stuff that they come up with. That uh, they were always trying to do something like that. So how long were you doing this? 
the whole tour? Actually, uh, we were in that part of our uh, first part of our tour. We were there through. I think we were there from June through October. Yeah, in November, we got a change of mission. The 101st Airborne was coming in to relieve us. So we gave them a right seat, left seat ride. Uh, and then our unit was attached, attached to a different battalion in the south in Talil. And to, and to give you a visual, uh, if you're familiar with Georgia, it's the easiest visual for me. Iraq to me was very similar to Georgia. Uh, even climate, north to south, hills in the north, you know, flat land in the south, and distance wises are accurate. So, so if you called, say, Baghdad was Atlanta, uh, then we were, when we got transferred down to Talil, you would call that maybe uh, Tifton. Okay. okay, that's probably geographically close. And uh, we were relieving a Texas National Guard unit that was uh, escorting fuelers uh, north all the way up to, uh, sometimes all the way up to, Mo to Mosul. And Mosul would be like Dahlonega. Well, if you, you were escorting fuelers, was that hard surface road or was it dirt? It was hard surface road. And you still had issues with Oh, the... yeah. Yeah. Because now you're dealing with local nationals driving these fuelers. And uh, you don't know what their intentions are. Uh, and they, they don't move with the same sense of urgency that we move with. Uh, you don't know if they're trying to set you up. Uh, so it was always, you know, you were always second guessing yeah. who, you were, who you were escorting where. And, uh, and, you know, sometimes we would have issues with some of them and they wouldn't go with us. And, uh, but that was, you know, we, we did that for a week or so. And then they said, oh, we need a platoon up around Balad to help out a transportation unit. They had been getting hit, and uh, they had taken some casualties, and they were couldn't accomplish a mission. So they needed a platoon to uh, fill them in. Mm -hmm. So uh, they chose my platoon, and they sent us up there. Uh, so we weren't in Talil very long before it was um, time for us to go back up to where it's a lot more active. It was pretty quiet down around Talil. So how long was your tour? It was a year. A year, okay, 365 days, that's right. It was a year. We, we left in May of 05 and we got back in May of 06. Was there, did you have an opportunity during that year to have what was known in earlier wars over Vietnam, R&R? &R? Oh yeah, every soldier got leave. Okay. Every soldier got a two week leave. Okay. So, uh, my particular one well, it was in January of 06. And, uh, you know, it's a, sort of a catch-22 with that. I mean, they, you know, they promise you that you're going to get your leave. If you're alive when you schedule your leave, you'll get your leave. Now you get to go home. Now you get to turn all that off and degrade your, your ability to survive in that environment you know, it's it's a catch-22. Uh, I know that for me and, and several of my friends, all I could do was I got to get back, you know, because you want to get to the end. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't really want to stop in, in that break because you, uh, a lot of times uh, coming at, back after that leave is when bad things would happen to soldiers. Because they and, lose their focus. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, so, you know, it's great to have that to look forward to. And it was great coming home to the leave. And for a couple of days, you know, sleeping in a bed and, and eating good food and seeing your friends and your family and all that. But before two, I mean, it's not but a couple of days where I got to get back. And that's all you do is, you know, I was a platoon sergeant. And I was like, and I had pretty much been on every single mission. And, uh, and now, now they were going to go on missions without me, and that just tore me up. Uh, but, and they did, they did have contact while I was gone, but nobody was significantly injured. So uh, now you get back and say, golly, uh, just got to make it to the next break, you know. 
So, I, you know, it's a, I think there's a lot of validity to say and go to war and come home when it's all done and not hanging a timetable on it because when you start putting dates on it, people start, human nature is you want to start looking at that date and it's, it's a distraction, I think. Not that I would have said, you know, uh, no, I'm not taking my leave because I'm going to take my leave. But uh, maybe in that situation, it's easier to do that way. I don't know. I think we're just still sort, sorting that kind of stuff out. But I think in hindsight, I think if you want to send a bunch of soldiers off to get a job done, tell them you, you come home when it's done, that's when you'll get your leave, then, uh, then maybe some of this stuff might not drag out as long as it does. I don't know. So was the was your unit conducting missions up until the time they they left? Mm -hmm. We were. Was did you have to stand down to get everything ready to come back? Probably for over a week's period. Okay. Different elements would stand down as their equipment was being transferred over to the incoming unit. And then you start transitioning to flight, manifest it, move you back to Kuwait to wait on a flight back to the States. Okay. Did you serve in Afghanistan also? I did. Okay. I don't want to spend all the time on Iraq. You came, you came back and then how long were you back? We were back. We got back in May of 06. And, uh, and we knew, you know, there was, there was stuff going on in Afghanistan. It was sort of like... When you were sent to Iraq, you were wondering, are you going to be sent to Iraq or Afghanistan? And uh, so we figured we were in a rotation. There were other National Guard units in the country, and it was starting to, it was starting to show a pattern of certain units going followed by other units. Yeah. So when we got back, it didn't take us long to figure out, you know what, we're getting ready to go back, to Af go back and this time we're going to Afghanistan. And, uh, and that's going to come up pretty quick. There's a rotation. The unit is supposed to have time to reset. Supposed to have time to, you know, get all your ailments taken care of, all your equipment stuff, everything issued, everybody requalified to go, everybody starts training, training, training again, and then bam, you're back in the in the cycle. So that for us wound up being uh, January of 2009 is when we left Griffin. Uh, February 2009, we left Griffin to start training to go to Afghanistan. It's difficult for an active duty unit to reset because, I mean, it, because of the time it takes and the workups and everything, but they're doing it all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, how was it with, uh, with your unit? I mean, yeah, well, I mean, that's a val very valid point. It takes us longer. It takes us longer because we don't have the luxury of having personnel there every day. Uh, the good thing about wars is uh, you wind up with a lot of money. And so you're able to bring more soldiers on active duty. So you can, you can increase your ability to reset a little bit that way. But it still takes time when you're still in a, in a schedule of uh, uh, weekend drills and, uh, and ATs, uh, two-week annual trainings. So... Uh, but, you know, I would say you get into a battle rhythm with that and it becomes pretty, uh, pretty routine to you. I mean, I'd like to say, you know, uh, you know, we do everything the regular army does that we do it on, on a part time basis. Well, how was retention? Uh, retention was. You know, I don't think I saw a big change before and in between. Uh, obviously, um, there were go there were those who came back and said, "That's it, I'm out," and uh, nobody could blame them. See you, man. Appreciate it. Uh, and then there were those that uh, maybe said, "Well, okay, you know, let's let's do the next thing." And uh, I know when I got back uh, from my rack, uh, I became eligible to retire active duty. And uh, so me and my wife were talking about that. And then we got the word that we were going to Afghanistan. And so we had another talk. And I said, no, I got to go, you know. Because I was the first sergeant of the unit mm -hmm. at that time, and I wasn't going to stay here. But, yeah. So 
So when did you deploy again? We deployed in May of 09. Okay. Same situation, year went over, and, or did you pick up gear over there? Uh, we didn't, we actually, we actually were back here by early April, the entire brigade. They had changed the rotations over there to where they were nine months in a combat zone. Okay. So uh, by the time we got all our equipment, and it's harder to move resources in and out of Afghanistan than it is Iraq. Uh, you know, it's not like you can just put everything on a boat to go to Afghanistan. It's got to be airlifted. So, <clears throat> so your your rotation there is pretty much nine months in theater, so to speak, uh, between travel, uh, train up, travel, and everything. It's still a year of active duty, mm -hmm. but probably nine to ten months in country is all. So did you go back up to NTC again? No, this time we went to uh, Camp Shelby in Mississippi. Mississippi. It was a, uh, it had become a uh, combat training center uh, during during that period. And uh, so we did most of our training. We did, we actually started out at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And then we went to Fort Stewart, Georgia. And then we went to, uh, um, Went to uh, Camp Shelby for the remainder of the time because they had the same situation. They had the same role players out there, and this time it was based on an Afghanistan scenario. Uh, and then once we got into Afghanistan, uh, our brigade was split up everywhere. And our primary mission there was to mentor and train the Afghan army the Afghan military, and the Border Patrol. So we would embed our personnel with their personnel and, uh, and help them train. And, and you, you know where that goes. Mm -hmm. you, see where, you see where that's led. So. Did you have any serious blue on blue incidents where the friendlies and... We did, we did. Not in my unit but uh, we did within our brigade. Uh, yeah. The FOB that we were sent to, and I'm just gonna show you the map. Uh, <clears throat> I did find a map of Afghanistan. Uh, don't know how easy it is to see. Yeah, you hold up one corner, I'll get the other. So uh, when you go into Afghanistan normally, uh, you're gonna fly into uh, Bagram or Kabul. And there, there you see. Kabul. There you see Kabul. That's where we flew into. That's where they split us up. They wound up sending my unit up here to Masri Sharif. Right here. We had units over here in Kunduz. We had units over here. Uh, basically, our battalion owned uh, this part of Afghanistan, along with coalition forces. And then the rest of the brigade was down here and over here. So, uh, <clears throat> again, you go, you go in and you don't really know exactly where you're going to go until they put you on a bird and says, this is where this one's going to land and that's where you're going to stay. Uh, so you train for a lot of different scenarios. And what, what was your mission in Afghanistan? Or did it differ much from... Uh... Completely, completely different for me personally. I was, number one, I was a first sergeant of a headquarters company. Uh, we wound up on a FOB. It was a FOB, Mike Spann. Uh, Mike Spann was the first CIA officer killed okay. uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, he was killed in that area. Um, so, you're talking about blue on blue. Before we got there, a couple of weeks before we got there, there was a young Navy soldier uh, a Navy soldier. There was a young seaman and there was a female with him uh, and they were doing PT within the fob we were on and one of the guards came out of the tower and shot them both dead while they were doing PT. So, I mean, it happened right there before we got there. So, 
because of that, obviously, we went in with a little bit of a stricter mm -hmm. control over it. Uh, we had about 600 people on that file. And it was a hub for the North to push out. Uh, the commander, my commander and I were the, what you call the mayor cell. We owned the, we owned the city that that was. So all the decisions that were made there were on us. So we had Navy personnel, uh, we had Air Force personnel, we had uh, Croatians, we had Germans, we had Norwegians. I don't even know who all was on that file. I just know it was like 600 folks. Did that, how difficult was it to deal with that? It was very difficult uh, because they all bring their own unique challenges. Uh, and uh, they all want a little bit of special consideration and then you wind up having to be the one that says yes or no. So you're trying, you know, can't make everybody happy. Uh, at the same time, you're kind of like, you know, I really don't care about none of y'all. Uh, I brought my unit over here and that's the only ones I'm really concerned about. So, you know, so my commander was the uh, diplomatic one uh, normally. So what, what kind of missions were the troops on? They were embedded trainers. We were actually sharing this fob with an Afghan military unit. So did they ever, were, were they not escorts or anything anymore? It was just, well, did, what, training in what? I mean, were, were, there, uh, were there Afghan cavalry units? No, no, pretty much. Uh, if you're a third world country and we're training you, you're going to be trained to be a grunt. Okay. You know? Uh, and so, you know, if, if it's a police, obviously the National Guard brings a lot to the fight in these situations. We've got police officers. We've got firefighters. We've got medical people. We've got the gamut. So we're, we're uniquely suited to these missions uh, to where they can embed anywhere and relate. So we, we had guys who were in the Guard who were civilian policemen and soldiers training the Afghan police. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the straight military roles, our guys would train the uh, Afghan military. And then you had Border Patrol. Again, that was more of a law enforcement. And, and I'd say the most of the uh, focus was uh, law enforcement related stuff. But again, the same situation in Iraq, tribal uh, issues that don't ever seem to be sorted out. And you're always you find out real quick that you can't trust this guy or that guy. Uh, so, was, was the uh, attitude of the indigenous people the same as it was in Iraq? You know, whatever, whatever grievances they had among themselves, the tribes, they were all focused on the invader? Yeah, you know, in, in Afghanistan, uh, they, they looked at you with a good bit of hate in their eyes because they've been fending off foreigners for eons, right? So here's another one. So where at least you knew where they were coming from. They would just as soon kill you as look at you. Uh, so, and convincing them that you were gonna make their situation any better was something that was gonna be pretty difficult to do. Did, did the Afghans have any idea what 9-11 was and what the American reaction to that was? You know, I would say so. I would say, yeah. Yeah, I would say that... Uh, it didn't matter that you were still on their turf. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Now, they look at it as uh, job opportunities. We're creating jobs when we do this. They're working in our fobs. You know, we vet them as best we can. We escort them. But uh, it's a... It's a boon to somebody who's able to work with an American. And it's, you know, it's icing on the cake if he can keep that secret from everybody but his family. So, you know, we would employ him in the FOBs. Did you ever have instances where an employee, an Afghan employee was discovered? You know, was there, was there retribution against him? Or? <clears throat> yes. Mm-hmm. I, I, I've heard of uh, a few instances in RAO where that was obvious. Sounds like a no-win situation. It does, doesn't it? Hmm. So 
Was that pretty much the tone of the whole tour? Did you, did you, I mean, it was just training all the time? Yeah, it was training and we, I had a scout platoon uh, and they would run missions. They were working with a local police uh, department <clears throat> in a mud hut and uh, they would, they would work with them. They had a good working relationship with them, uh, you know, and you do the best you can to train them. Uh, and I will say that the, the, those folks proved to be better fighters than uh, the ones in Iraq. But, uh, but there's always the element of what can you do for me? Uh, you know, we need, we need a well. Um, you guys gonna put us in a well? Because if you don't, you know, the Taliban, man, they're, they're making me a job offer. Uh, so how's this thing gonna work? And again, there's kids. It's, it's uh, my favorite thing about both the deployments was interactions with kids because it's almost like you just got away from mm. everything that disgusts you so much for just a minute to look at a kid and interact with a kid. It was great. Um, so, you know, we had we had our scout platoon going out on those missions uh, and uh, it was a completely different, for me, a completely different experience. Now, elements of our brigade were elsewhere. A uh, good friend of mine uh, that was my lead scout in Iraq uh, was uh, shot, and uh, he wasn't with us, so uh, so that was tough because, you know, we go to Iraq, we get back from Iraq, we get split up in Afghanistan, and then he gets shot, and it just drives you crazy that you weren't there, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, he's still alive, but, you know, he's confined to a wheelchair and uh, he's got a young family that, you know, it's just real sad that uh, those kind of things happen and it gets lost uh, in the fact that, you know, we're over there trying to help and, and that's how this family's paying for that offer of help. You know, I don't know if that makes any sense. No, I understand you. How did that affect morale? Uh, well, for the guys that knew him. Uh, no, I mean in uh, general, just uh, the the philosophy you were talking about, we're here to help and we're not getting that. Uh, it turns you into a, a pretty cynical person. It turns you into uh, uh, less likely to make good decisions in the field kind of person. That, uh, you know, there's the there's the I want revenge immediately factor that can't be denied. And, uh, and it's all about timing. Uh, when we were in Iraq, I know that uh, uh, we had a couple of friends killed one day in an IED attack. And uh, we responded, uh, got them evacuated. They were actually airlifted to the green zone. And I was in contact on the radio. My guys were asking me the whole time, how they doing? And they told me all the way back to our father. They got them, they're stable. Looks like they're, they're gonna make it. So we're, we're pretty doggone. We're coming right through an area where <clears throat> if we'd have known different, then the actions of the locals might have been interpreted a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So we get back and they said, no, they were dead. But I wasn't gonna tell y'all why y'all were out there. So, I mean, that's, that's reality. What kind of armament does a Bradley have? Bradley's actually got an aluminum armor. <clears throat> I can't remember the specifications. Uh, I can tell you that I never was in a Bradley in a combat zone. I was in a Humvee. Uh, in Afghanistan, we had the uh, heavy uh, the heavy vehicles. I can't remember their nomenclature right now. Uh, but they were improved for defeating IEDs and such. Boat-shaped hulls, mm. thicker armor, uh, higher up off the road. Uh, Successful? Yeah. Yeah, you know, and the difference in Afghanistan is the terrain. Uh, pretty easy to roll them over, too, and roll them down a hill and into a river where everybody drowns. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. so, uh, but, you know, in Iraq, we were in Humvees. In Afghanistan, we were in Humvees, and the uh, the acronym escapes me right now, but it's the it's the big. It wasn't the striker vehicle, was it? It wasn't strikers, no. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I can see it, but I don't, I don't 
I was just talking about them yesterday. That's that's the way it is, right? <laughs> so, you know, we we have a lot of protection, but uh, <clears throat> some of those IEDs are just they're just powerful powerful things. Do you know where they were getting the explosives from or the components from? Was it? There was always rumors that they were coming from different countries. You know, when we were in Iraq, Iran supposedly was supplying a lot of that stuff. Uh, but it's pretty much homemade stuff. I mean, okay. in all those countries, wars have been going on for so long that there's stockpiles of, of ammunition mm -hmm. that can be modified to do just about anything you want to do. And I think that's probably where the majority of it comes from. So when did you come back? Came back in April of 2010. Okay. Good reaction from again from the community. Yeah, yeah. Again, Griffin. Uh, I've seen several communities. I've had units in other communities, and uh, one thing that is consistent across Georgia is the patriotism of the communities. And the other thing that is consistent to me is how much more, and I guess obviously I'm biased, it seems to be uh, emphasized here in Griffin. And I'm sure that's because of my perspective. But at the same time, most folks who've come here who live in other places come to this unit and train, leave with the same, wow, that Griffin's a great place, supporting the military, so. the. The people who came back, uh, there's a lot of talk in the media and, and I guess in general in the country about PTSD and how about the kids who came back, uh, how, how are they faring? Yeah, there's uh, PTSD's real. That is from somebody who was skeptical at first to, you know, been able to look back at some of the events and people that I've known through these things, PTSD is real, and it's you know it's just how do you deal with it? Uh, I have friends with PTSD. I have acquaintances who claim to have PTSD. Uh, who am I to judge? Um, you know, people ask my wife. Uh, is he normal? Yeah, she said he was an asshole before he left. He's an asshole when he got back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't, apparently there's no change here, so I'm good. You, you brought some things with you. One of the things was a map you showed us. Are there some other things that you'd like to have included in the, in the record? Well, you know, in preparing for this, uh, I got to looking around trying to jog my memory because it's been a while. Uh, it's been 11 years since Iraq and seven since Afghanistan, so... Um, I found this the other day my wife had created, and it's just, you know, it's just some pictures of, uh, uh, this was during Iraq, and uh, shows, uh, there's your orders, uh, I mean, I forgot she had done this, uh, us getting ready, you know, uh, one of the things is we were wearing BDUs, mm. before we went to Iraq, we went to ACUs, we were the first unit to go to ACUs, and uh, we took a lot of pride in that. And the locals started calling us shadow soldiers because supposedly, you know, they couldn't see us at dusk. I, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, family stuff. There's uh, stuff in there about the unit. I thought it was pretty interesting. I thought when I had time, I was going to go back and read all this stuff. And, you know, one common thing in here is the Griffin Daily News has is, is got coverage just like Griffin is, uh, you know. Uh, and seeing a lot of these folks... You remember a lot of these guys. Some of these are pictures from uh, some of our missions. I know it's kind of hard to see, but she's even got some emails in here that I had sent her. And uh, and apparently wasn't too bad because I was joking a lot with her. I, I didn't uh, I didn't want her to worry too much, you know. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you were you able to talk to your family? Did you have the opportunity? Yeah, you know, uh, just about everywhere you went, there was an internet cafe. Okay. Uh, 
But, you know, connectivity was iffy. And then if somebody, if there was something significant happened, they'd shut it down for three days. So uh, families at home knew uh, he hadn't heard from him in three days, something's happened. Because soldiers are going to, you know, you want to make sure that the right things are done when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, pretty much uh, I could at times shoot an email in Iraq uh, every other day, every three days, something like that, check in on them. Uh, we're getting care packages all the time. Uh, in Afghanistan, I did the majority of my work behind a computer with a very good connection. So I watched, uh, I, I lived vicariously through the internet watching my grandson be, my first grandchild be born two weeks before I came home from Afghanistan. How did your kids handle that you were gone? I mean, the, there was enough in the news, I think, to cause concern for some for smaller people. You know, uh, that's, you know, I can't believe I've talked this long and hadn't said anything. Everything couldn't have been possible to be successful uh, in all aspects if it wasn't for my family. You know, my wife, she got a little taste of it during Desert Storm of, okay, I got to take care of business while he's gone. To the point where a couple things kind of went haywire and she realized it could kind of go haywire. So she took it all away from me when I came back. She goes, you're going to stay in. I'm going to be in charge. Sounds good to me. And uh, so, I mean, she's just amazing uh, holding the family together, not letting anybody. She wouldn't send me any kind of bad news. Uh, and, uh, and she wouldn't tell the girls anything to get them concerned. She did ask me, uh, she said, I want to know the truth and I want to know, uh, I don't want you to sugarcoat it and I want to know as soon as you can get it to me. And so, you know, first few days in, in Iraq, she says, okay, that's enough. I changed my mind. I don't want to know. So, uh, you know, again, sort of like the leave situation, the email, the being able to talk to your family, uh, it's great for some things, but I think, I think there's a lot of busted families because of that as well, because it is hard. I think the advantage that we had is we were mature. I, I turned 47 years old in Iraq. I turned 51 years old in Afghanistan, and I think it was, uh, that was an advantage. To, to have had enough life experience to know mm -hmm. what to appreciate and, and how to put things in perspective a little bit better. Did, uh, did the families of the younger folks hold up okay? Some of them did. A lot of them didn't. A lot of them didn't. Didn't understand? Didn't understand, didn't. You know, it's all, it's all rah, rah, rah. Get on the bus. God bless you. God bless America. And then the bills can't get paid, and then the babies get sick, and then, uh, and then you know, human nature being human nature, uh, things start to fall apart. They start not to trust each other. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that was a huge advantage. But I, I can't emphasize how much uh, that none of none of my ability to cope with any of this would have been possible without my family. That's great. Well, we're, we're kind of coming to the end of time here. I mentioned to you that the final phase of this has given you the opportunity to speak your mind editorially or any other way you'd like. Just your thoughts on whatever you want to think about and whatever you want to say. You know, I think the main thing I would say <clears throat> is how proud I am to be a part of the National Guard. The National Guard that got a bad rap for so long uh, ha has now excelled in these situations. And uh, to me, there's not a more patriotic person in the world who, who can say, I'll, I'll, do that, I'll do that on the side, and then if something significant happens, you got count on me. But, you know, until then, I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be whatever it may be. Uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to raise my family. I'm going to be a football coach, a softball coach. I'm going to go to 
ballet, but when it, when it's time to go, you can count on me. And and to me, that's that's the one thing that I would hope is never lost on anybody. I'm, I'm just proud of the legacy of the National Guard, the citizen soldier, and that's not a slight to any other service. Yeah. Uh, it's just uh, you know it's been a it's been a very uh, satisfying organization to be associated with all these years. Great. Well, thank you for uh, telling your story. It's a good interview. Uh, and thank you for your service. Yes, we sir. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate that too. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Just one quick question. You left the National Guard in 2012. What have you been doing since? I was hanging out with these three guys, other guys in Griffin. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, well, I'm going to wind up an alcoholic, so <laughs> i got to do something else. <laughs> yeah, uh, I went to school. Uh, I had a couple part-time jobs, and I was going to school. I'd always told my girls to uh, get a degree, and I hated people who don't, you know, practice what they preach, and I was one of those guys, but they did. They got their degree. So when I came back, I said, you know, until I find something that I want to do, uh, I was not intending on being full-time retired. Uh, it was just time for me to go. And uh, uh, I went to school for a little while, and then this came up uh, in 2015. I'm now the state coordinator for military funeral honors in Georgia. And that's, uh, that's a National Guard uh, team that's all over the state of Georgia. And we do uh, roughly 250 funerals a month. And uh, my guys are all over. So I'm back to working with soldiers, which is where my heart is. And so I'm, a lot of times you come back from these things and you go, oh, why, why didn't I, what, why did I get lucky? You know, so you're always looking for it. Is, is, this, is this it? So I don't know if this is it right now or not, but if, if it is, so be it. I'm, I'm happy with it, you know. Uh, I'm still influencing soldiers and they're still influencing me. So as long as I can do it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Fantastic. you for your service. Thank you. Hey, Ricky, you got that.